everybody, it's Eugene Lee Show, and welcome. Welcome to Forensics Talks. This is episode 53. And uh, just a couple of things before we get started. First off, uh, just want to let everybody know that if you are on YouTube, great, but you can also see us on Facebook and LinkedIn. Uh, if you are watching and you want to chat as well, by all means, just type in to the chat window. Hey, let us know where you're from. It's always nice to know. And if you have any questions along the way, pop them in there and I'll make sure that uh, we get that to our guest. Sometimes I forget, but I'll do my best to uh, keep checking back there. Uh, just a couple of quick announcements before we get going here. Um, one is uh, the International Association of Forensic and Security Metrology. I'll just put this up on my screen here. Uh, this is a uh, joint conference with the Association of Crime Scene Reconstruction that's being held in Denver on February 14th through the 28th. And it's really interesting uh, that it's the first time it's a joint, uh, a joint uh, conference like this, and they're actually doing a... Uh, like a mass casualty exercise at the First Bank Arena downtown. So it's going to be like simulated, you know, shooting and stuff like that. So pretty exciting uh, what they're, uh, what they have uh, planned. Uh, I'll be teaching the basic laser scanner certification course. That's on the Sunday. And I'm also going to be doing a cast off pattern workshop uh, later in the week. I believe it's on the Wednesday. So if you're interested in that, just head over to IAFSM.org. Also, I want to say a big thank you to the people uh, who attended the Forensic Photography Symposium last week. Uh, it went really, really well, super well. I was very, very pleased with uh, the way uh, that people responded, uh, all the speakers and the sponsors, and just the international people who came together and discussed you know, forensic photography concepts and that sort of thing. Uh, I've gotten a lot of requests now to do it again. And when I first started, I wasn't really thinking long term, but it looks like uh, we'll probably do this again next year. And so uh, I'll give you ample notice next time around. OK, well, we're going to get started here. And um, my guest today is Michael Street, and he's a retired police sergeant and an award winning forensic facial imaging expert based in the Los Angeles metro area. For 42 years, he's been helping law enforcement agencies like the Baltimore Police Department and the Los Angeles Police Department to solve their toughest cases. In 2011, Mike, Michael became the Baltimore Police Department's first ever full time IAI certified forensic artist. He was tasked with building the, their forensic facial imaging unit from the ground up, while at the same time managing one of the country's busiest forensic art caseloads. He later led the unit to become the first of its kind to be awarded ISO 17020 accreditation. And in 2015, he converted the Baltimore Police Department's forensic facial imaging unit to an online operation. And they were the first major police department or agency in the country to do so. Today, Michael remains the department's forensic artist, and he's the owner of SketchCop Solutions, and he provides remote services, products, training, and uh, to various law enforcement agencies worldwide. And you can catch uh, a lot of his videos and lectures and stuff like that online as well. So uh, let me bring him in here. Hey, Michael, how you doing? Hi, Eugene. Thanks for having me. Hey, uh, pleasure to have you here, and I really appreciate you uh, sharing your knowledge uh, about your uh, your background and your experience. So, um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you the same thing that I ask everybody the first time around. When you were a kid, were you an artist? Were you like the artist kid, sketching and drawing? I was. Okay, and did did you aspire to be like? Did you want to be? I mean, you work with the police, but did you aspire to be an artist or do some something artistic in life? I did, um, you know, like like most people who drew, I, I had a goal, and my goal was to be a Disney animator. And my father, who was a career police officer, he didn't want to hear anything about that. He that was the <laughs> last thing he wanted me to be was an artist. <laughs> I can see that. Okay, I understand. But uh, well, it's great. I didn't know that. It's it's good to know. Some people fall into it like in different ways, but you actually have, you know, I, I guess a passion for art. Uh, so fair to say that. And. Um, what can, what can you tell me about your transition to the the police? Like, so how, how did you make it in there? And, and I just want to bring this up because uh, some of the, the viewers are, you know, people who are in, in university or they're, you know, currently thinking about their career. Or maybe they want to change a career. But um, what kind of per career path did you have into, um, you know, forensic facial imaging? Uh, it, it came through being involved in law enforcement. I, I mean, by the time I graduated high school, I was ready to go into college there was the whole starving artist syndrome. And although I wanted to be a cartoonist and an animator, I, I wanted to eat too, you know, and I wanted to, I, 
it wasn't it wasn't fulfilling it was just there were police around my house all the time because my father was a, a police officer and they were telling amazing stories and i always worked outside or i always enjoyed being outside and you know enjoyed helping people and um, so i i transitioned into police work and forensic artistry and forensic facial imaging was just a, it wasn't necessarily an afterthought it was just i just never occurred to me until i saw a sketch in the news one night I had this aha moment where it was like, okay, now, now I know how to blend the two together. I see. Were there any like early people or other agencies that were, you know, already doing this that kind of inspired you or, or got you going? Yes. You know, here in the Los Angeles area, the Los Angeles police department historically had a, a full-time forensic artist on staff since the mid fifties. And the Los Angeles County Sheriff's department had a similar situation. They, had a, they actually had a group of like three artists that, work for the department, you know, doing graphics for presentations and, you know, doing the calligraphy for the certificates and such. And they were called upon to do crime scene modeling and crime scene diagramming as well as facial composites and developing uh, facial reconstructions as well. Yeah. And um, if, if we go back in time, like how, what are some of maybe like this, the first uses of uh you know like police sketches or or you know forensic artists like way back like what, what are some of the earliest cases or uses that you know of i think one of them one of the earliest ones uh was in the 1930s when uh, charles Lindbergh's baby was kidnapped and, and ultimately found uh, dead you know the, there was a sketch done of the person who was eventually identified as bruno hopman and who was eventually put to death uh for the uh, kidnapping and, and death of Charles Lindbergh's baby. But it goes, I think it goes back even as far here in the United States as the 1920s when there was a bombing on Wall Street. And back then, they didn't have anybody trained. They just grabbed whatever newspaper artist, whoever local artist, I mean, whoever could hold a pencil and had some art skills uh, to draw the sketches. Oh, interesting. And um, I was just thinking back to like, you know, in the movies, you see like the old West uh, wanted posters or whatever. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's even farther back. But did, I wonder if they had people back then even drawing sketches. Well, they were, you know, those were truly the first facial composites by definition, really. So I guess you could go back to, you know, the, the, the mid 1800s. And maybe even farther back but you know back then again they probably just used someone who could draw and since then you know you we've learned more about how eyewitnesses work and eyewitness memory and, and how to retrieve that memory and such so uh where then it was more about the art it's become a little more technical since then yeah and i think there was even uh it was it you may i think i saw a lecture that you did where you talked about possibly even Mar on the martin luther king case there, there may have been a, a sketch done as well there was there was this there was a sketch done that never made it to media. Um, of course, you know the FBI has had artists for years, and the artist that did that sketch was one of my early mentors, and uh, he told an amazing story about trying to get out of Washington D.C. after the assassination because an artist was dispatched right away because there were eyewitnesses that you know had seen him you know by binoculars by the gun you know at various different times. As a matter of fact, the the rooming house he rented uh, to take the fatal shot. Um, you know, he was able to interview somebody there, but they were able to identify uh, James Earl Ray via fingerprint before wow. they could uh, publish the sketch. Let me ask you about the, like your official discipline or title. Like, is it a, like, what's the difference between a, a police sketch artist or a composite artist or a composite sketch artist? Like, what is the proper term to use here? Or, or are they similar or the same? It all depends on who you talk to, because I, you know, I, I remember sitting in a IAI meeting back when, when the forensic artist subdiscipline was starting, and I think people discussed and argued for two hours over what we should call ourselves, because traditionally you're called police sketch artists, police composite artists. And I think they wanted to elevate the title to give it a more professional sounding um, term. So, you know, from that, forensic artist was born. But I mean, police composite artists, forensic artists forensic facial imaging expert it all depends on where you are in the country or the world and, and what they you know officially call them but it's all the same yeah okay and so let's talk about the role like what is the primary role or goal of a police sketch artist well the in the traditional sense of police sketch artists those are the ones uh and what people associate with doing actual uh facial sketches from eyewitness description Either the eyewitness or the victim do a crime, 
Um, but when you get past that, there are several other sub-disciplines. You know, a, a well-trained police sketch artist will know how to do facial reconstructions, facial comparisons, post-mortem imaging, age progressions, and, and such. But the typical police sketch artist on a daily basis probably produces more composite sketches than anything else. Oh, I see. And um, I saw somewhere that you wrote about the difference between like um, consulting and communicating. Can you, can you explain that? Well, I, I think what happens is, is everyone gets, you know, hung up on the, the, the sketching, the sketching part of it, the art part of it. But the real art is the ability to communicate with someone you've never met before, to quickly gain their trust, to build rapport and establish that relationship. So that they'll, they'll share what happened and you'll be able to, you know, create a sketch from that. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the sketch is just the vehicle in the end product, so to speak, but getting to that you know, from point A to point D, so to speak, um, involves a lot of talking, a lot of communication, a lot of active listening. So do you find that when you talk to people about what you do, that like, what's, what's their perception about what you do versus the reality of what you do? The perception of what I do is that I'm sitting in a quiet room, just placidly drawing and, you know, soft music playing in the background. And it's, it's, that couldn't be farther from the truth. I mean, I've done sketches in the back, storeroom of a 7-Eleven in the backseat of a car with a criminal informant um, at a crime scene. You could still smell the gun smoke in the air. I mean, it, it's anything but what the media shows, what people's perceptions are, what I do. Oh, interesting. Uh, let me ask you about the like the basic process. Um, so, you know, a, a shooting happens, a crime is committed or something, and then there's um, witnesses, either an eyewitness that's not involved, sort of like a bystander, and then, or there could be the somebody involved in that, you know, a victim or something like that. How soon after do you get with them and you have to obviously sit down with them and there's probably like a whole bunch of people that want to talk to these people. So, you know, how do you, how do you fit in and, and pull them away for you, for what you need to do versus all the other people? And how, how does that process work? Well, you know, for me, it works differently because there's a couple of things. I'm either the first person call or I'm the last person call when all the leads run out. And because I used to be a detective in my previous career, um, you know, I, I, I was in their shoes at one time. It's hard not to say, you know, you should call me first because I'm, an, I'm a resource only. I'm not there to run their investigation. Uh, but one of the one of the most famous cases, I, I famous for lack of a better term, high profile cases, probably better. When a little girl was abducted um, several, in 2002 here in Southern California, by the time I was called, from the time she was kidnapped, the time I got there, she's kidnapped at 530 in the afternoon. I didn't get the call until midnight. In between there, she must have talked to a dozen people. I'm surprised I, I, I got anything. And after we put the sketch out, within 48 hours of the sketch being published, they had a suspect identified. Mm -hmm. And now he's sitting on death row. Interesting. Um, let me ask you about the the interview process itself, because, um, you know, when I'm, it's bad enough, for example, like when you're talking to somebody and trying to relay some information and, you know, there's that broken telephone game that you play or whatever, but just mm -hmm. trying to describe the way somebody looks uh, to another person is very, very difficult. So um, how do you, how do you sort of maximize or make that efficient and, you know, really try to narrow down and, and hone in on the details of, you know, this person's look? Well, you know, we, we use a combination of, of conversation and visual aids. So typically when someone comes in and I meet them for the very first time, I'll do a quick visual assessment and try to see what they're wearing, what they're carrying, so I can develop rapport by, you know, sharing some commonalities we have. So, you know, when people get that people like them or they, they can connect with them somehow, they share interests and such, it's that bridge that starts the conversation. And then once that occurs, and then before I start the interview, I set the I help manage and set the expectations uh, for what I want from them and what they can expect from me. And from there we start talking. And of course, you know, memory is is there's two parts: there's verbal and there's visual. And the visual is always stronger than the verbal. But um, I've got a catalog of facial references I show them. So to be able to sh show them the proper references, I have to exploit their verbal uh, description to the to the to exhaust it totally then i show them pictures of what they describe so for example if they say the person had like thin lips i'm going to show them a, a reference 
page of thin lips. And I go through the whole face. And once I do that, then I draw the sketch from there. And then we have a modification process. And then we refine the image and we close it out. I, it's, it's a, it's a five-step pro it's a, a five-step process uh, the, the, I call the, you know, my, the sketch top solution where you gather the information, you build the sketch, you modify it, you refine it and you close them out. So when they leave the office, they feel that that image is the best they could do. And they've got something that they're proud of that they can be helpful to the investigation. Yeah, right. And I mean, I imagine this varies, but in terms of time, like how much time do you need to, you know, sit with the person and, and, and finish that, that process? Well, you know, me personally, about an hour and a half tops, maybe two hours, but typically I try to get everything done, you know, door to door in an hour and a half, because these days people are so busy. They got family, work, school. There's so many other things competing for their attention, their time that I've only got so much of that. So I have to use it to the best of my ability. Uh, you know, when, when artists start saying, well, you know, I, it, it takes me four to five hours to do a sketch um, at some, at some point in time, it goes from being a, a sketch to a fine art portrait. Mm -hmm. And so you have to kind of cut it off at some point and uh, get that person back into their life. But because you have to bring them back at some point. Um, and I, when I say bring them back, in other words, you're part the the forensic artists, police sketch arts, whatever you choose to call us. Um, we're part of the investigative process. We're part of the criminal justice process. So if for some reason we keep them too long, we say something's going to tick them off. You know, um, that detective has to get them back in for a re-interview or to eventually testify. Um, so I try to respect their time, mm -hmm. and um, so I'm, I've been able to get really successful results in about ninety minutes, typically. Okay. And I mean, the people are there with you the whole time, basically, until they, yes. okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So I can see if it's a four or five hour deal, uh, people <laughs> are going to get a little edgy yeah, to get out of there. My old joke is you're going to wake them up when you're finished. I mean, to show them the sketch because it, <laughs> it can get tedious and it, and, and it can get, um, you know, not, all, not all sketch interviews go again, like really well, because you're dealing with a lot of, um, crime victims and eyewitnesses who, who live high risk lifestyles. For example, I had a, I had a woman strangle me one time during a, a, a sketch session. I had a woman try to sell me drugs during a sketch session so she could raise money to go see her probation officer. So, you know, you're not getting the the um, the executive or the the overwrought housewife that you know has has been traumatized and stuff. You're getting um, people who are who are criminals themselves. I used to joke that you know you know, one day they're a criminal, they come into my office, they're a victim, they walk out and they go back to being a criminal again. Mm. Yeah, no, I understand. Yeah, you get all, all kinds of different, yeah, all, uh, kinds. All, all kinds of different people. Yeah, sure. Um, I want to ask you about the tools of the trade. And traditionally, I mean, it's pencil and paper, right? Is that that's how it started? I mean, you, you sketch and, and that's pretty much what you would use, correct? Yep. If I walk by someone's desk on my way to the interview room, I grab the number two pencil and on my way past the copy machine, I grabbed a piece of paper out of the copy machine and jumped in the interview room and away I went. So um, about what point, because I want I would, I want to get into the like software and technology and hardware and how it's sort of shifted. But um, at about what point was the first uh, were the first people starting to use like sort of digital media for sketching? I, you know, I, I, I started flirting with it in, in the mid nineties. Um, I didn't convert totally till 2015, but you know, modern day, uh, you know, the, um, I, I would say some of the practitioners were starting to use it more widespread in the, um, yeah, I would say, you know, around 2010, something 2010, like that. Yeah. And then but I mean, when you people did, did it farther back, but you know, like I said, I flirted with Photoshop, the earlier versions back in the, in the mid nineties. Okay, but I mean that's what and that that was going to be my question though. When you began, was it it was more graphic arts? It wasn't a dedicated sketching uh, forensic you know sketching software. It was like you know Corel or Photoshop or something like that back then. Yeah, you know if you're talking about the facial composite software itself, um, I would say that um, you know Smith and Wesson had their manual uh, overlay system um, that started back in 1959, 1960, and you started seeing some of the um, 
conversion to software, um, probably, I would say, early 90s, late 80s. But they were very crude back then because the graphic, the video cards and the, the graphics and, and such, the, the way the, the, the software language was and such, okay. it was very crude. And it wasn't until the, uh, I think, 1993. So uh, what was when, what was this overlay thing you're talking about? The Smith and oh, Wesson. What's that? What's that about? Oh my goodness! They have back in um, the person that created it. What he did was he had like um, it's almost like four by six inch um, pieces of acetate that had um, a facial feature burnished on it, and so they go they they came in a they came organized in a wooden box tab, and so um, they take them out and eyewitness would pick nose eyes and such, and they would. They would have a base face and they would lay all the facial features on top of it and then they paper clip it together. And if they wanted to draw a mustache on it, they take a grease pencil, look like cat whiskers. They, you know, sketch them on there and then they Xerox it and, and distribute them to all the police officers. And um, <laughs> it was crazy. Yeah. It was, you know, and then, and, and, and this is what, what's happened because, you know, as a software developer and, and, and a salesperson myself, I mean, you're having to work against, the crude technology from before that everybody remembers. Uh, so you're, you're fighting that because nobody ever, when they developed it further, considered the ramifications and the process that we use itself it was just basically, you know, write a bunch of code, throw a, pro a product together and get it out there. Right. Now, interesting. Some people are commenting here that said that somebody scanned them. They were scanning them into Photoshop layers. <laughs> so that was kind of funny. Yeah. And, and some and some people do that. There are some agencies um, I see out there. Um, they create their own databases of facial features. They use Photoshop layers to put them together. And, and really seriously, I, you know, I always tell people whatever works best for your investigation, you're the one that best knows that. And, and I even say the same thing. I, I use the best tools available and the best one for a particular case. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. Well, let's, let's jump forward then. So let's talk about, um, I want to talk about hardware and then I want to start getting into the software like sketch cop and, and stuff yeah. like that and sort of how that came through. So in terms of hardware today, I mean, obviously, um, you can sketch, uh, like I've seen, you know, CAD designers and stuff like that, or engineering designers, they'll have like a, you know, touchscreen type stuff or whatever. So is that, is that something that you'll be using or the tablets, the, what are they called? The pen tablets, Wacom tablets, is that what they're called? Mm -hmm. I use, I, in my daily work, I use a Wacom 32-inch uh, wow. Cintiq Pro. Okay. And um, I also have a, an iPad. I take in the field an iPad Pro. I also have a, a portable Cintiq as well, a 13-inch um, version. So I, I, I do use a variety. Uh, and then, like, for myself, um, when I'm creating, when I draw my hand sketches on my, in my studio, I'm using Corel Painter, but if I go out in the field, I'm using uh, Procreate on the iPad Pro. I see. Um, so and I use a variety of tools and, and software and such. So let, let's let, well, let's talk about. Um, I'm just thinking, what else? So there's tablets, there's pens, there's your touch screens. Um, anything else that you use, like from a hardware standpoint? From a hardware standpoint, um, for sketches, no. For you know, facial reconstructions, I might use a haptic device sometimes. Um, to do uh, to do sculpting, uh, I have a variety of pens. I have a, a Wacom Airbrush. I have a, a standard Wacom 2D, and then I have a, a 3D stylus as well. Okay. Well, let's talk. Let's let's talk about the the software then, because we're kind of getting in there. And it's interesting you're talking. Somebody had asked a question about you know like doing the um, re facial reconstruction, the actual on skulls and things like that. So I'll ask you about that in a bit. But um, um, oh, another good point. Uh, somebody. Uh, just just pointed out and it was a question that was going to ask and had to do with what about information that's given to you we talked about interview like just information that you ask somebody but what about um cctv footage what about um uh, post-mortem photographs and and things like that do you, do you tend to like how often do you tend to work with those types of media um a lot as a matter of fact before we came on the air i received a uh email with a post over the deceased person's face in it that I have to work on to make media ready here after uh, we jump off. Uh, but we, I get CCT. I don't get as many CCTV images as I probably should because a lot of detectives, they'll, after, after the sketch, they'll tell me, oh yeah, by the way, we got some CCTV footage, but we didn't want to show you the pictures because we didn't want to unduly influence you. And I said, well, actually, <laughs> you, you, it's nothing negative. I mean, because the CCTV images 
especially if there's a suggestion of a face or facial feature, to me, it's helpful because people don't remember everything. They're not going to remember every little facial detail. So the CCTV image actually helps as a visual aid uh, to help remind them and to help kind of guide me as well. So any law enforcement officers out there listening, yes, please. All the information you can provide, even CCTV footage. Please. <laughs> Interesting. Actually, there was another point that I, I'll, I'll get into that we're getting sidetracked a little bit, but it, it popped into my mind. And that had to do with the accuracy and how close you need to get the the sketch. And for example, I had a guest uh, once, uh, Dr. Caroline Wilkinson from the UK, and she's doing like uh, facial reconstructions and things like that. But we talked about, you know, how accurately you can get to a person's face from a skull. But sometimes uh, it's just like a caricature, right? So, you know, if I look at a, a cartoon drawing of Donald Trump, right? So it doesn't look like him, but I recognize it that it's him. I know it's him because they exaggerate certain features or things mm -hmm. that stick, you know, his hair or, or whatever. So um, do you do you have to do any of that uh, when you're doing your your sketches? Absolutely. If, 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 if there's one thing someone's going to remember, you know, as a witness to a crime, it's probably going to be something that resonates with the public and, and that person's friends who probably made fun of him or her for that particular feature their entire life. So you, I usually start the interviews with, is there one major feature that stood out that would, that would say, for example, the, the description was a male Caucasian, 5'9", 150 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes. And on the beaches in Southern California here, there's like 100,000 of those. If you take them all, line them up, what, the, what kind of facial feature would the suspect have would set them apart from the other 9,999 people? Right, right. And I, okay. and I just kind of take that and enhance that and build from there. Okay, I gotcha, I gotcha. Um, in terms of the software, I mean, you... Um, you, you, you're, you're working now with uh, SketchCop. So mm -hmm. can you talk to me about how you got into SketchCop and kind of what the, the need was there? I mean, were there other products? And then you just said, hey, this is something that I, I need to do? Sure. Um, you know, when I first started in 1980 as a forensic artist, I was seeing a lot of these software programs coming out. I just wasn't satisfied with their limitations. I wasn't satisfied with the quality of the end product. And I actually consulted for one company, but the rest of them didn't have any forensic artists that I was aware of that were on board. And you could tell by the lack of training, the lack of understanding of the, of the field itself. And so I always had an eye on trying to improve the process because I knew at some point in time that computers and or software is going to impact the way we did our job. And I figured if that was going to be the case, I wanted to be the one helping to drive it. And so it wasn't until I retired from active police work in 2008 and started my own consulting company, SketchCop Solutions, that our, our main, we wanted to select and or build our own product, so to speak, uh, that was going to be different than anybody else had in terms of the customer service we offered, the training we offered, and the quality of the end product, most of all. Something that was had a, a user-friendly, uh, something that was backed by forensic artists that were that were uh, in the field in the industry, and uh, something I could really get behind and put my name on. Right, and you've mentioned before about like uh, databases and such. So um, there has to be it, to make it easy for people. I guess there's a library of hairstyles, nose mm -hmm. shapes, facial shapes. So who, is that something that you've been building or that yourself, or how do, how does that work, or where do you get where do you get the database from? Well, you can get the uh, you can you can take mug shots and such, and you can isolate the different facial features and create them in, in different you know different software programs to you know to help cre create it. I draw, I you know I hand draw other ones and such. So there's a lot of different sources you, you can pull from to to get that that uh, hand drawn you know traditional artist type of feel, which I think resonates with everybody because when you start seeing. Uh, you know, computerized composite sketches that look like mug shots, you know, people don't have, they have an expectation that's the exact person you're looking for. With sketches, they know that it's an approximation because they're used to seeing police sketches. And um, so I wanted to keep the end product looking like a traditional police sketch so they, they, they wouldn't make that leap to believing that the image was exactly what the person looked like.
And how, what's the basic process when you're using software? I mean, is it, uh, do you start, you start with the, the face do you, or like you said, do you start with, you know, somebody says, well, I, I, you know, I could see, you know, his ears, his ears were, you know, stuck out to me or something. And then you start with the ears or, or how, like, what's the typical workflow for building up the, the, the composite? You know, it, it's pretty much what the, um, the operator wants, because again, we wanted to, make the process similar to what a police sketch artist would do. In other words, I prefer building from the outside of the face inward. Some people develop the face, the inner part of the face and develop outward. Some start with the major feature that someone remembers, like starts with a really big nose and builds around that. And um, so we wanted to um, have the software be um, eyewitness driven, relationship based, and is close to the same process a police sketch artist would use. So that's one of the reasons why we provide relevant police sketch artist based training for them to use the software as a tool. Because again, the interview is the meat and potatoes. It's the main part of being able to build a successful sketch. If, if Michelangelo were here today, the, regardless of his artistic prowess, his, his skills and such, Unless he was an active listener, unless he was a good communicator, any product he produced would be meaningless. Yeah. So yeah. we want to have the software act as a tool and then the, the art of communication really be what, what, what drives it, so to speak. Right. So has, has the software um, optimize the workflow. So for example, a traditionally sketching by hand versus doing it on software, do you find that there's a, there's a benefit in terms of accuracy, time, uh, what kinds of things are, are beneficial? Well, the benefit, the, the first thing is beneficial is, is that it's less expensive for an agency to buy and train the software because it can train more groups of people. So it becomes a force multiplier and a 24 seven tool versus having one artist available for a large agency when that person's off duty, person's on vacation, they retire. Um, it also creates a signature image for the agency. So if you have three or four artists, you don't have three or four different eight, uh, types of styles of drawing coming out. And also um, it creates a, an efficient workflow because most artists, they do sketches as a secondary ancillary duty. Their primary duty is a police officer, detective, police chief, secretary, whatever. And so it allows them to quickly create an image and get back to their primary duty. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting because traditionally you may have somebody who was more of an artist or had a skill for drawing that might want to go into that area, but you probably get people, I don't know, that have very little, <laughs> they probably couldn't draw with a pencil very well. They have to, or they have to train and, and really train, train to, in order to get well. But have you seen like a wide variety of different people getting into this now? We have. I mean, again, it's it's really great for people who want to contribute and, and, and make an impact. Um, and they're really good communicators. They just can't draw a straight line. And that's fine. The, the software takes care of that. Um, you know, we, um, we've had a lot of um, success with it um, in terms of the accuracy, in terms of the effectiveness of it. Um, but it was really, like like I said, it was, it was built, um, I'm sorry, and back to the original question, I've actually had sketch artists use it and embrace it um, because they like the quality of, they like the easy use. They like the fact they could still do sketches, but get back to their primary job as a crime scene investigator and such. And, and with the software now, you can take that sketch and import it into a sketching program if you're a sketch artist, a traditional artist, and make some, and make some changes and such and make that image really pop and enhance it quite a bit. Yeah, that makes sense. And, uh, does does for example does sketch cop allow you to bring in other images too like could you bring in like a photograph and then trace on it or can you bring in other features or something like that you could bring in other features that aren't necessarily in the database like a, a, a unique style of hat uh you know maybe facial hair that we don't have in there and then um you know when you start building drawing tools into you know a sketching program like that it makes it real heavy and, and, and it really makes it more complicated in terms of programming. So we have, um, we export to a, a program called GIMP yeah. and um, it's open source software and you can do all the, the sketching and, and layer enhancements and such in there. Right now you can do, um, you can, um, you can do a scaling 
you can do uh, skewing. You can do, we have a, a color. Um, you can colorize the, the sketch, you know, brightness, contrast controls, erasing. But if you want to draw, do clone tools, things like that, you know, we'll, you take it into GIMP and, and, and take it from there. Yeah, GIMP's a great program. It's it's basically free Photoshop. I mean, it's pretty open much, source. Yeah, pretty much, yeah. Yeah, it does a whole bunch of stuff. We use it uh, for some other things. I mean, I have Photoshop as well, but I, mm -hmm. I like the fact that, you know, it's a low cost, freely available tool. Nothing wrong with that. Um, in terms of training, like when you're, when you first get, you know, start, somebody starting from zero or there's an agency that wants to get a few people trained up, um, about how much time does it take to, you know, start from zero and, you know, get to a point where they're somewhat proficient with producing sketches? I, th I think if you have a 40 hour training course, you know, where you're, you, where you're balancing the, you know, the artistic skills and you're uh, emphasizing the communication skills and such, you could you could probably get them up and ready to go with a week long course and keeping in mind, of course, you know, that you want to start off, uh, you know, the, the student themselves wants to start off with this, some of the lesser cases, so to speak, maybe some of the, I mean, you don't want to jump right into doing murder cases right away. But again, you know, if, if once you, once people train, you know, the agency has that expectation that, you know, if they have a homicide, they should be able to call them and, and, and talk, talk, talk them through homicide, mm -hmm. uh, serial, serial rape and such. I mean, when I first started doing these, I had a 40 hour course and I hadn't drawn any human faces before. I mean, I was all drawing, you know, Daffy Duck and, and things like that, but um, it took me a while to get my feet under me. So I was doing low level cases, you know, indecent exposures and, you know, some deaths and, you know, some assaults. And it took me a while to work my way up to the big cases. Yeah. It's, and what kind of exercises do you work on? Like what would, uh, like a, a student that takes a course like that, like what kinds of things can they expect to do during the training? You know, expect to get some training on facial anatomy, you know, how to put all the pieces together, how to, how to, how to efficiently draw uh, the face itself. And then uh, again, how to interview people and how to use your, uh, you know, facial, your, um, sorry, your reference resources and things, how to collect them, how to use them, how to organize them, uh, how to testify in court as an expert, because depending upon where you're at, you may testify in court on every case. And some like in 42 years, if I've testified in 12 cases, I'd be surprised. Yeah. Interesting. And um, what, organizations, what groups, you know, what, what kinds of things are available to people who are interested in this area? Like if they want to be, I mean, you have IAI certification, but I'm just wondering, could you explain like what's available to people who want to pursue, you know, sort of more study or be recognized somehow? The IAI, the International Association for Identification is the only forensic body or organization I'm aware of that, that offers certification. You know, different people who train in this, will offer their own certification um, and, and that's fine, you know, uh, but I think if anyone wants to be recognized by a, a, a well-established organization, you know, pursuing IAI certification would certainly be recommended. They, you can go to their site at the IAI.org and under forensic art certification, they'll give you the parameters and the requirements for becoming certified. And um, I, I think it's a good thing to work towards. And, and really, uh, you know, this is such a niche field. I mean, there, uh, there are a handful of people that train. And again, I always tell people that, you know, to train under someone who is going to train similar to a style you're comfortable with and or that has some really good qualifications and such. Um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things. A lot of it's just just having a, you know, developing a mentor. I mean, I was lucky to have the mentors. Mentorship is is probably, you know, one of the quickest, probably the best way to learn because you're getting people who are established in the field mm -hmm. who actually have infield experience. Yeah, it's a good point. I don't know where people, I mean, do they, can they call up the IAI and say, hey, look, I'm looking to do this. Uh, uh, is there, are there any mentors around? I'm not sure if, if there, how many there would be in, you know, in North America or abroad. Well, there, there, there's not. That when I first started, you know, when I when I saw my first composite sketch when I was a police officer, I said, "This is what I want to do." It was it was the Los Angeles Police Department. It was there, it was one of their agency sketches. So the next day, I was on the phone with LAPD looking for their sketch artist, and I got a hold of him. It just so happened he was registering people for a week long class he's going to have. 
I took his class. We became friends. I'd go up there and spend many afternoons, you know, shadowing him and picking his brain. And, and um, it, it, it turned into a lifelong relationship. I mean, and it just happened through me seeking them out. So there's not like a mentor pool, so to speak. I think a lot of people just find a local, you know, sketch artist that is uh, recommended and, and depending upon, you know, how they, how they gel together and how they, you know, it can be a good thing. Yeah. Have you, uh, what about outside of uh, North America? Do you, are there any, are there any countries or any areas where, you know, there are a lot of, a lot more like uh, uh, sketch artists that are doing this kind of thing? Uh, my first thought is India. India uses sketches like no country I've ever seen. I mean, they, they use a lot of police sketches. Uh, their police artists there are not typically quote police artists. They're usually local artists at the police departments. They either, you know, pay them a, a, a meager stipend or they they volunteer. Uh, but they get, it's really interesting. They they do a lot of sketches, and they barely get paid, but they get a lot of threats on their life too. I mean, I read more newspaper articles about police Indian police sketch artists getting their life threatened than anywhere I've ever heard of or seen in my life. But um, but that's the that's the one country I know that the law enforcement there uses them religiously. Right. Right. And what about, uh, what about in the UK? Do you know anyone in the UK that's doing this sort of thing or maybe not as much? They, you know, the UK uses a lot of, um, the, you know, my competitive competitor software. They use, uh, they use eFit over there, uh, extensively. Hmm. And it makes sense because there's a couple of universities there that develop their own software with, uh, eyewitness memory professors and such. And so, they like to use in-country um, products and such, and so they. And EFIT's been around a long time, and um, and so they use more computer composites there in the UK than they do freehand sketch artists. I think. I see. Well, interesting. Um, you know, you mentioned before about uh, things like uh, 3D technology, haptic devices, and stuff like that. So I'm wondering, what's sort of the progression for you? I mean, you've got SketchCop, and you're doing that or whatever, but are, are you looking to do some other things uh, in the future, like maybe with 3D technology? I don't know how that helps, or maybe, I don't know, photogrammetry or some of these other technologies? Absolutely. I, I, right now, I'm focusing on... Um you know, in getting more into 3D with uh, skull reconstruct or facial reconstruction. And also now um, I just started uh, training uh, on craniofacial superimposition using 3D skulls and such to do photo overlays and identify people from skulls, um, you know, by superimposing their, their photo over the skull. And, right, right. Uh, yeah, I've seen that before. Uh, but I guess, uh, well, I guess, so you have a photo or something and then you try to you try to get the right angle of the skull yep. and then you kind of project it. That was that what you do? Yeah. Okay. And is there, is there a different software that you're using for that? There's a, um, there's a company uh, I'm working with right now out of Spain and um, they've got this software. Um, Panacea is the uh, name of the, is a, of the company. And, uh, and they've got this AI powered software um, that they're marketing and they're using and such. And um I use I'm you know I'm using ZBrush for facial reconstructions and I'm you know getting ready to talk you know to take delivery of a, a, a handheld 3D scanner and of course you know we've we've discussed photogrammetry before um, so I think a lot of um, a lot of this is going into the 3D space and so again you know uh, there have been a, I mean I've talked to a lot of friends of artists that have noticed over the last couple of years their workload going down less requests for sketches maybe because of COVID, maybe because of CCTV images and the proliferation of cameras and such. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I pivoted and turned towards, you know, forensic uh, video uh, editing and I'm sorry, uh, you know, editing and analysis and such. So if it involves, you know, facial imaging and facial identification at some point, and, you know, I, I'm trying to keep up with the, with the um, progression of 3D in, in video and things like that. Yeah, sure. That makes that makes total sense. Uh, it's a nice, it's a lovely compliment for sure. Um, you, you mentioned artificial intelligence, and then I was just trying to think. You know, I wonder if anyone is thinking about a ways that artificial intelligence may help to uh, enhance the sketch or even your work process. Um, is did you have any thoughts there? You know, my thought there, and I, and I have thought about you know AI as it as it you know as it might be uh, an aid 
to our SketchCop program. And it could be, um, you know, the artificial intelligence. It could be, you know, taking an eyewitness description and, and auto producing certain sketches and such for um, comparison, uh, you know, to be able to develop different likenesses that are similar, but yet different. So the um, eyewitness almost has like a, a photo lineup to pick up, you know, pick out the closest sketch. And from there, the, um, the eyewitness could help enhance it and make any modifications. I, I'm really wary of um, things that are like automatic, so to speak, because I, I think that, you know, I still trust the eyewitness, even though, you know, DNA and has, has proven them, proven them, proven them, proven them to be wrong. Can't talk this morning. Um, but yet, they, they they still manage to get it so right in so many cases that I'm I'm reluctant to cut the human element out of it. I think AI is good for workflow, um, but in terms of the final product, I, I still think it, it needs that and requires that human touch. Yeah, you made a point there. So in terms of you know the the quality or in terms of the efficiency or the performance and how well that uh, you know facial sketches do for police agencies, do, do you say do you see there's a clear benefit? Oh, I, I think that using police sketches is, is clearly a benefit. I think they've gotten away from using them because they become too reliant on uh, surveillance video. They become too reliant on DNA. They become too reliant on forensic genealogy. And those are all very good tools of technologies that are developing every day. And, and I have to say that, you know, you know, being a police officer for so long, I have to be about the best tool that makes the most impact that catches the most crooks and puts the right people in jail. Even if, even if the demise of my own technology, even if the demise of my own software, even if the demise of my own profession, so to speak, because it's all about, you know, keeping communities safe and making sure the, the right people go to jail to, to, to reach that goal. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, so, so at the moment you're doing work for, uh, the Baltimore police sort of officially like in, in like, yes. as, as, okay. And um, what can you talk about maybe some other agencies you've done work for, or maybe internationally too? Um, right now I did, um, I'm under contract with the Los Angeles police department. My company is and as well as Baltimore police department. I recently completed a, a, a case for the Ugandan police force. Um, I've had some work requests out of India, um, you know, trained, um, officers and detectives in Paraguay in the Philippines. So, you know, it, initially, you know, Sketch Cop Solutions just started out as a USA centric agency. But again, you, you, you well know from being consulted, having your own business, you have to kind of go where the action is, so to speak. So when work goes down here, then it only made sense when you're seeing, you know, sketches being used more in other countries that you would reach out to those organizations, those countries as well. Um, so in as much as the people might think that the lack of English language could be a limitation, you know, Engl the English language is, is still pretty predominant in a lot of places in the world and such. So, and again, if, if it doesn't, you know, for documents we have and interviewing and such, we've got translators on staff under contract. So um, anything I need to have translated written or verbally and such um, for interviews and such in other countries. We just, it's just getting on the phone. Excellent. Well, Mike, uh, what I want to do is um, if people want to reach out to you somehow, uh, I've, I've just put your website up on here. So it's, you know, just pretty easy sketchcop.com. And um, where else can, pe can people get you on social media elsewhere? Right. They can go to sketchcop.com. There's a contact form there, or they can email contact at sketchcop.com. And on social media, at the Sketch Cop official on Instagram and Facebook, uh, Michael W. Street on LinkedIn, and on Twitter, it's uh, Sketch Cop. Excellent. Well, look, Michael, thank you so much for your time today. I think it was really interesting. And I have to say, you got a cool job. <laughs> so I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> you know what? I, I tell you what, I, every day with a phone call or email is it, just the variety and the changes and stuff I, and the people I meet. I, I, I couldn't imagine myself doing anything else. Yeah, it's I, I can see the, uh, I can see the appeal, and I can see that it could be a very fulfilling job that you do. Like on some days, so I'm sure you get frustrated and you have everything else, but I, I can see how it could be a very, uh, you know, you walk away at the end of the day and you, you wake up in the morning, you know, ready to go to work. I, I do. You know what the problem is? Is that there's, there's only 24 hours in a day, 
and there's only 45 minutes in this interview because I tell you what, I, you know, obviously we only scratch the surface of what I do and there's so much I've got going. I, I just sleep is essential these days. So like I say, we could, we could stretch a day to 36 hours, 48 hours. I'd be much happier. <laughs> you need a clone. <laughs> exactly. Oh yeah. 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 All right. Hey, listen, th thanks a lot. Hey, hang back for a second and then I'll, I'll come back to you in a minute. Excellent. Thanks, Eugene. All right. Cheers. Bye-bye. All right, folks. Well, that does it. A uh, really interesting interview. And uh, geez, what a what a great, uh, yeah, like I said, I, I think it could be a really fun kind of uh, job to be doing, very fulfilling. And, uh, you know, if you, certainly if you're an artist, uh, it'd be pretty awesome. Anyway, just to remind people that uh, there is the IAFSM conference. It's coming up. So make sure that uh, if you're interested, go ahead and have a look, February 14th to 28th. And that does it for this particular episode. Thanks so much, everyone. I really appreciate all your time and we shall see you soon. Take care. Bye-bye.